our next speakers, I would imagine, Laurie and Stephen, you maybe could have used some of Sarah's therapy after last spring in the Wasatch. <laughs> um, oh, that one went flat, didn't it? <laughs> oh, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> these folks have come up for, uh, <clears throat> for to, well, for to share uh, what went on in Little Cottonwood Canyon last winter. Um, Lori Delaney grew up in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, attended college in the Pacific Northwest, and then uh, went to Utah, 2007. Went to Snowbird, started at, at, as a lift op, and worked into snow, ski patrolling, learned a bunch about avalanches and logistics, and then in 2014, she began working for the Utah DOT in Little Cottonwood. Um, I first heard about Lori and Lori's absolute calm when the shit was hitting the fan from Mark Sauer, who speaks really highly of you during a couple of uh, bad episodes. So Lori was there, and with her was Stephen Clark, who is also from Salt Lake City, working for the Department of Transportation in 2013. He's also, in addition to working for a UDOT, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Utah in the Atmospheric Sciences Department, and another instructor for the American Avalanche Institute. I cannot wait to see this presentation. Stephen and Lori, welcome. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, if anyone is curious about uh, events that lead up to burnout, just pay attention. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, as Lynn said, um, I am the, uh, the Utah Avalanche Program Manager uh, for the state of Utah. And, uh, Lori is the Little County Canyon Supervisor. Uh, we've been working together pretty much our entire time at UDOT. And yeah, we're going to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, what went on last winter in really specifically Little Cottonwood, but I would say this, was a, this whole winter in Utah was a, a very uh, difficult uh, thing to manage, so we're going to kind of dive in. Just a little bit of background first. Um, so the Utah Department of Transportation and the Avalanche Forecasting Crew, our goal is to forecast and mitigate avalanches on all state and federal highways in the state. Um, we do that through various forecasting, forecasting techniques and do, using mitigation equipment and closures to uh, manage the risk to those roadways. Uh, we have a team, we kind of have four main forecasting areas, Little Cottonwood Canyon being the lion's share of that, Big Cottonwood, Provo Canyon, and then the re any other state rural highway that has an avalanche problem. And we're pretty lucky in Utah. We have a pretty big toolbox to be able to do some of this mitigation work that we have to do. We have five howitzers, uh, a couple avalanchers. Uh, in Little Cottonwood, we operate 21 Gazdex, 13 Beeson Towers, and a couple Obelix. And all of that equipment takes an incredible amount of time and energy and money to um, not only install, but continue to operate throughout a winter season. Um, so for those of you who are, are not familiar, uh, this is Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, it is a 13 mile long roadway that starts in the Salt Lake Valley and ends at the town of Alta. Um, along the roadway, it incorporates it, and travels through the track and runout of 64 named avalanche paths. Um, a typical busy winter day, there's well over 5,000 vehicles in the canyon, um, and that can, that can peak at up to 7,000 vehicles. Um, so just to kind of orient you to some of the, maybe some, some place names, if you're looking at the map, um, if you're looking at Snowbird, typically from Snowbird to the right, we consider the upper canyon, and kind of in between Snowbird and the Tanner's Avalanche Path is the mid canyon, and everything below Tanner's is what is kind of referred to as the lower canyon. Some of the more frequent paths in Little Cottonwood are in the mid canyon. This is all big south facing terrain. It has well over 33,000 feet of vertical relief, and some of the bigger paths, like uh, the Salt Lake Twins, has close to 5,000 feet of vertical relief. Uh, predominant avalanche problems for this area is direct action avalanches, so doing with storm slab instabilities and, 
And as you trans transition into springtime, uh, getting more into wet avalanche types. So this is kind of going to be a story on how some of this destruction ended up uh, occurring. Uh, this is a campground at Tanner's uh, flat campground in Little Cotton Canyon, and we're going to kind of go through a series of events of how we ended up getting to some of this destruction. So we'll take you back to October of last year, and uh, we had a really great fall. It was beautiful, beautiful leaves. There were lots of people in the canyon enjoying those leaves. Not a flake of snow on the ground, which was amazing. As we probably all know, that's somewhat unusual, but we were pretty psyched about it. And then that changed. October 22nd, the leaves went away, and it snowed. It snowed a lot. It was high density. Um, it was deep. And then the rest of the fall season, we were dealing with our you know, prep for the season with a snowpack on the ground. And that involves um, our cache being snowed out, so we had to bring in a snowcat to transport some of our explosives. We obviously had quite a bit of snow on the ground at that point, so we were then relegated to a lot of helicopter time to move us around so that we could do our maintenance on the hill. We have a lot of steep, rocky terrain that we're trying to get to, to get to our Gaza shelters and transport gas. It was uh, too much snow to walk, but not enough to ski. So a really inconvenient medium there. Okay, so after that, it kept snowing, um, and it was amazing. These were really somewhat exceptional for what we get anymore, storms. They were coming in completely right side up, higher density to lighter density, very little wind. We quickly accumulated a pretty nice deep um, snowpack, 50-inch depth, through the middle of December. Um, we wish it would have stayed that way, but it didn't. So then we move into later December into early January, and there's a lot going on here, but really some of the key components is that we were dealing with these really broad spectrum forecasts. So in our 12-hour periods, we were seeing forecasts of anywhere from nine to uh, 20 inches of snow and three quarters of an inch to two inches of water. And this is every 12-hour period. And our larger storm totals are giving us something around three and a half to almost six inches of water, 30 to 60 inches of snow. So that's really hard to plan for. And uh, all you can do at this point is really plan for the worst. Even if you don't think it's going to happen, what if it does? Well, you look like an idiot. So operationally, we really had to step back. We had to be super conservative. And we had to do a lot. We were closing constantly. We were doing control work constantly. In addition to that, we also had picked up um, kind of a unique snowpack situa situation that we don't normally see. It happens, it's happened three times in the 11 years that I've worked at this job, uh, RR. So at Utah, we have pretty strong sun. Usually that goes away quickly, it doesn't stick around. However, it was so snowy, so cloudy, that when the sun came out for five hours, it did the damage and then that RR got preserved. So then, you know, we're getting these large amounts of snowfall. All of a sudden, we're seeing forecasts for atmospheric rivers, lots of wind. The writing's on the wall. We got avalanches. So moving through January, we're busy. Um, we're seeing lots of avalanches. We're doing lots of control work, uh, lots of cleanup. We're constantly busy. Uh, this is a, an Instagram reel that our communications team put together. We're really really lucky to have these guys, and they were just constantly putting the word out to people. The reason the road's closed, guys, guys, there actually is something going on up there. We 
turn the volume down so I'm gonna be locked out with glass of your drums. Okay, so at this point we were, we were in it. It was January, it was cold, and it just kept snowing. Um, every forecast that we were getting was for uh, prolonged storm periods with very short breaks. And that really led to us doing in this kind of perpetual cycle of uh, do avalanche mitigation work, clean up the debris, make a new forecast, and repeat. And it, ultimately what ended up happening is that we, uh, quickly realized that we were about to run out of ammunition. Uh, you know, mo most of our caches can hold well over 500 rounds of ammo, um, and it became apparent that we, if the storm track was gonna keep progressing the way it was, we needed to get an ammunition delivery. And as you can expect, that's not the easiest thing to do, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, basically, once you get an ammo delivery in the wintertime, you have to move every single artillery around about four times between offloading off of a truck into a snowcat up to a cache. Um, and so we were doing that in between any, any 24 hour or 30 hour break that we had, we were doing some kind of restocking work. Um, and at kind of around this time, we started losing our rack systems. They either were breaking, running out of gas, et cetera. And so we were spending any break that we had in between these storm cycles, uh, restocking and getting ready for the next storm. And I'm gonna kind of throw in some rules here, so like this is kind of like rule number one is always stay ready for the next storm. And February came around and it just kept going. It just kept snowing. Um, we were starting to see some of the deeper snowpacks that any of us on the UDOT team had seen in our careers, and that led to a lot of logistical challenges um, with maintaining some of this equipment. Uh, we were starting to lose our weather breaks. We were having to, to hand carry gas around to these Gazic shelters. We were trying to undig our infrastructure to maintain some kind of operational capacity. And that really was just taking any extra moment that we had, we were trying to just maintain our equipment. And then we eventually were not able to, main, to maintain a lot of that equipment. Through some significant rack breakdowns, we were missing we lost our ability to do avalanche mitigation work effectively above, especially structures in the Snowbird Village. So we were starting to employ some avalanche work in places that I'd never done that. And it was a lot of trial and error and really doing honestly subpar mitigation in a lot of places. We were trying to get in the helicopter as much as we could when weather windows provided. Um, and then again, the rest of the time we were digging out and trying to maintain our infrastructure. So in addition to some racks failures <clears throat> for various reasons, we were also losing our instrumentation, our weather stations. Uh, on the top left there, you can see our Atwater plot in summer, and on the right, that's the Atwater plot as we're moving into late March. Um, this structure is over 20 feet tall. Um, and then down here is our Mid Canyon study plot at 7,500 feet. We are starting to lose our ETI, our depth stakes. This is our guard study plot at around 8,600 feet by our office. Um, this was also starting to be subducted. Eventually, we had to add extensions to all of our total depth stakes just to be able to continue taking measurements. And at this point, by the end of March, we had received 180 inches with 17 inches of water for the month of March which was over double our historic monthly average, and 17 inches is the most that's ever been recorded in Little Cottonwood since we've started recording in the 60s. And with that, um, as you'd expect, with an incredibly deep snowpack, every time we're doing control work, every storm, we're starting to see fairly substantial avalanches coming down and affecting the roadway. And these are some of our smaller slide paths, but they were putting piles of debris that were 15 feet deep on the roadway every single time. And we got some video.
that's white pine three, white pine shoot three. There's a whole series of shoots there that um, can often run in conjunction. In addition to that, we were starting to see a loss of effectiveness with some of our control tactics, uh, in particular the artillery. So we would shoot into certain start zones and we wouldn't hear a report. Now we don't know if that's a dud or if it's just so deep at that point that um, it's muffled and it's not doing anything. But if you don't get an avalanche as a result, you have to kind of assume that some, nothing, did, nothing happened. So at that point, we're moving into a paradigm where we're actually shooting multiple times, we're hunting around in the same path with different targets, and then eventually just shooting the same target over and over with the hopes of a different result. And uh, Stephen's rule number three, double tap. Okay, so here is kind of really, I think at the point of the winter when everyone was really maxed out um, in more ways than one. Um, like, like Lori mentioned, every time we were doing mitigation work, we were bearing the highway. And what that really ended up resulting in is the burden getting put on the maintenance crews. These teams were often working 14, 16 hour days, um, clearing snow, trying to find places to put the debris and really just trying to maintain some level of road opening when we did have those uh, options. And again, like we were seeing some of the deepest settled snowpacks that we'd ever seen in the Mid Canyon. And, you know, normally in late March, you're thinking that the end is in sight, but we had a weather forecast that was going to produce one of the larger storms of the winter for the first week of April. So we took this opportunity, and at this point, I kind of talked about earlier, we were doing resource management. We were trying to maybe try and do some restocking, try and maintain our operations. At this point in the winter, we were triaging our resources. We only had so much left that we, had, at a certain point, had to stop doing mitigation work and really kind of meter our efforts. So we chose to get in the helicopter this day and do some bonus work um, and ended up producing some fairly sizable results um, to protect some structures in the Snowbird Village. And at this point, and yeah, you can see like this, this Powder cloud overruns uh, a portion of the silver ski area, one of the lifts, and these are very, very big three avalanches. So, as Stephen said, at this point, um, we're really taking stock. We're fully into resource management mode. Um, we're using all of our tools extensively, every single mission, sometimes two missions a day. So we're seeing this is a, a shot sheet or an inventory sheet for one of, our, one of our gun mounts. And we're performing missions, as I said, once, twice a day. We're shooting 20 bullets, 29 bullets, 38 bullets. So we're eating through our inventory really quickly. And we know this is coming, but when it does, you know, you have to reevaluate. So there we are, we're down to 40 bullets with the size of these previous missions. That's not gonna go very far. And here we are, we've had over 800 inches of snow. Our snowpack is incredibly deep. And we have this forecast, not great. Um, so how do you plan for that? Well, you can't fight it anymore. You have to go back to the tried and true, the old school method, you close. So with that, April 2nd, we closed overnight, and we basically put the messaging out that there was no estimated time of opening, and that was for days. Luckily, we have this communications team once again, so they were putting messages out similar to what you're seeing up there, saying that there was no estimated time of opening. Um, we worked with the ski areas so that they were putting messaging out, and we really tried to clear the canyon out. We tried to get people to vacate. It was a big scare tactic, but it's what we needed to do. And it worked overall. Um, we didn't have too many people up in the canyon. A lot of people left. Um, you know, most times people don't believe when you tell them that you're not, that they're not gonna catch their flight tomorrow. But if you threaten them enough, eventually it gets through. So there we were. And, uh, 
Stephen and I'll kind of talk through this one, but. So yeah, evening of April 2nd, we closed Little Cottonwood at 10 p.m. And we did not even attempt to do much mitigation work except for some very specific uh, places to protect structures through April 3rd and through the morning of April 4th. Uh, the forecast was to, for this storm to taper off and we decided that we needed to try and uh, reestablish some kind of emergency egress in the canyon and do some very selective mitigation work in the canyon. Um, so after a, a fairly widespread natural avalanche cycle on the morning of the 4th, the PM artillery mission produced some additional significant avalanches. And at that point, we felt like we had bought ourselves an operational window to try and uh, do some debris clearing, maintain some access um, to the canyon. And then it sort of evolved into we needed to try and do some additional mitigation with an avalanche in the lower part of the canyon uh, to try and touch a couple little places that we can't shoot with the artillery. And again, this is kind of going into this resource triage. So after a full day of doing mitigation work in probably three other places in the state, I showed up at Little Cottonwood around 6 p.m. with an avalanche and we did some avalanching. And we got some small results um, and the forecast for us for it to generally taper off, but given the time of day, we were trying to kind of call it quits, I think, for the day. Um, and I would say shortly after that avalanche, avalanche remission finished, a very large natural avalanche came out of the Maybird Path, which is just up Canyon, and blocked the road. So now we're all stuck below this large avalanche, and we're, the only way out of the canyon at this point is downhill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I will say that time probably got away from us. Um, you know, we were, we were in the midst of trying to complete our mission and get out of there, and then we couldn't get out of there except for one direction. Um, so this moose had the right idea. It got out of there. <laughs> we might have saved that moose's life. But uh, yeah, once that natural occurred up, upstream of us and we were forced to move downstream, um, it kind of turned into a whole different scenario. And in the dark, of course, things are always worse, but it also got worse. So we basically started heading down Canyon and in some, some way, somewhat of a coordinated effort um, trying to expose ourselves to uh, a couple different avalanche paths one at a time. And we started getting a radio call from the dozer operator that they were seeing debris uh, in a place above B Gate, which is what we historically consider a safe spot. And so that was uh, somewhat alarming to hear over the radio. And we ended up driving down uh, and regrouping at a place called the B Gate, which is just, just in the... Uh, run out of the Salt Lake Twins path, and probably f a few minutes after this video ended, we all got hit by a really big powder cloud, which basically sounds like you're in a very intense hailstorm. Uh, but that really sort of, again, took the stress level to another place that we hadn't been before. Um, and really through like a heroic effort of some maintenance workers, we were able to make the ultimate decision of we had to expose this one person to get us out of the canyon that night. And it was a very painful hour. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, we sat there for over an hour watching uh, a good friend, a maintenance worker, working on this big pile of debris uh, while we were wondering if we were actually in a safe spot, but there wasn't really an option. So, um, you know, we would be so dead in the water without these guys. I just have to give so much credence to what they do for us. But uh, it was incredible. He pushed a lane through this big pile of debris. Uh, we did not, luckily, have to watch him get hit. And then we, one by one, made our way out there and slowly worked our way down the canyon. There were several other avalanche paths that we had to travel under, which had not run up to that point. And by the time we got to the mouth of the canyon, I don't think any of us have ever been so glad to get out of that canyon. Um, 
And in a rare turn of events, I live up in the canyon, so it was a little bit of role reversal, but I was trapped out of the canyon. So I got to follow Stephen home to stay at his spare bedroom. And it was a little bit of uh, chaos in the valley as well. It had been a big snowfall event down there. And uh, there were semis sideways in the neighborhood. There were cars on the sidewalks. There were cars in ditches. And I hate to say it, it made me feel better. <laughs> so that, um, I guess before I saw the mayhem and it made me feel better about myself, we regrouped at the station, the maintenance shed down in the valley, made a plan for the next morning, which consisted of meeting the next morning um, with no intention to go back up into the canyon until all snowfall had stopped. Uh, we had visibility and we'd allowed time to settle out. So in the meantime, there was, were still a couple forecasters up in the canyon. They were staying focused on the task at hand of course, they were worried about us, but you got to do your job. So the shot sheet that um, they put together for the next morning, our coworker Brett Corpola sent this down, and I really appreciated this, make them all. So that was the end of our artillery rounds for that particular gun mount for the moment. So we're done. Um, we call in a helicopter to the plow shed down in the valley, we jump in and we go do a little bit of helicopter bombing, don't see much in the way of results, but really what it was was a big carnage tour. Or surveying the damage, either way. So as we're flying up the canyon, we see what we see. This was the avalanche that ran naturally um, and blocked us. This is the Maybird slide path. And pretty quickly, something that became evident as we we're flying up the canyon is that um, all of a sudden we realized who was responsible for all of this snowfall this winter. This is the all hail the whale reference. <laughs> I guess if you haven't seen this, take a tour around downtown Salt Lake. And here's a little Where's Waldo for you. Um, on the bottom left, that's a loader. It's in the debris. We did not park that loader um, in a place we thought it was exposed, but uh, this is the last seen point up there of that loader the afternoon previous. This is after a large triggered avalanche, which actually created new trim lines in that Maybird slide path. So the loader gets parked below that, and then a couple hours later, this much bigger natural avalanche comes down and engulfs the loader. And uh, to quote the maintenance worker who saved our lives later, well, the loader's in the debris. <laughs> yeah, this is just a helicopter view of kind of two of the bigger avalanches. Avalanches during that's like, this is Tanner, so there's like three, four hundred feet of roadway buried there, over three meters deep. Uh, many, many acres of con con coniferous forest destroyed. This video doesn't really do the scale very to justice very well. So just and this is kind of what some of the debris cleanup started to look like on the afternoon of, I believe, the fifth. Um, at this point, there was so much debris on the road, we had to call in reinforcements. So these are snow cats, snow, many snow cats from Snowbird and Altiskira who had come down the road to help out. There's two D6 dozers and a loader, and it took them about four hours to get through that Tanner's debris, which is quite impressive. And that bottom right photo is uh, where an avalanche path called Culpit 4 had come across the road. Um, not, didn't put too much debris on the road, but it only has historical evidence of hitting the road a couple times. And that upper right photo is kind of a view from where we were parked that night, uh, where that avalanche path out of the Twins had jumped the ridge uh, and overrun this kind of low oak ridge line and put debris where we had never really seen it before. And this just kind of wraps up what those last two weeks of March and early April were like. It was 14 feet of snow over 11 inches of water. Um, well, during many of those storm periods, there's over five inch an hour snowfall rates. Um, and again, this is the, this photo is a kind of like the peak snow height for the Atwater study plot. So that snow is well over 15 feet deep. And then just some of the avalanches during those two week periods. Um, by the avalanche numbers are impressive themselves. I think the road hits 
uh, are also equally impressive. As those storms progressed, every avalanche that we were triggering was hitting the road. So we got through that storm cycle, but we were far from done with dealing with this uh, event. So all of those late March, early April storms were cold winter storms, but it's springtime, so you can guess what's about to happen. Um, as we move into April 6th, our forecast is for rapidly warming temps and direct April sun. So the writing is on the wall. Uh, this is really difficult to forecast for. We know something's probably going to happen, but we don't know what or where or how. So we do what we can the morning of 4-6. We do some heli bombing, but it's really cold. And you can guess how that went. We got zero results. At 7 o'clock AM, it was 3 degrees Fahrenheit. At our study plot, by 12 o'clock, it was 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Shortly after noon, uh, we received a report of a natural avalanche, large natural avalanche, up around Snowbird Entry 4, which crossed the road, crossed over into Snowbird's Chickadee Run right next to its Chickadee Lift. At this time, the roadway was still closed. We still had debris blocking it. We still had clearing operations going on. But both Alta and Snowbird were operating in a fairly minimal capacity. So this run, this lift, was open. Luckily, because there were very few people up there and even fewer who were beginner skiers and wanted to stick around for a prolonged road closure, there was nobody involved in this. But it was a big pile of debris. We were really lucky. Um, this, of course, immediately prompted a multi-hour thorough search as well as resort closures, both Snowbird and Alta, and the pulling in of all maintenance workers, all equipment, getting them to safe places so that we could focus our efforts in one location. So once we'd done all of that, we'd pulled in, we'd gotten small, um, you know, what's our next step? Well, of course, what do you do? You do some more testing, so we bring in a helicopter again. We start testing with some of our periphery racks, even though we'd shot those areas prior. And uh, we do see results with the helicopter, primarily from Cornus. We hit the road down in the mid canyon with some wet debris. But the most notable result, um, it was a little bit alarming too, but uh, was up above the town of Alta. This is a pretty big avalanche, but what's notable about it is that we shot a Wiesen Tower 2,000 feet away, and then this happened. So that was a really interesting remote trigger. Um, big deep slab ran down into a feature called Grizzly Gulch, filled it up with a couple hundred feet of debris, and ran within, I don't know, it wasn't close to the road, three, 400 feet, but it was, it was big. So that was um, kind of elevated our level of concern for how the future was gonna go. So that night we remained closed, and then we started making some somewhat unusual plans for the next couple of days. What we had going on was good overnight freeze, but really warm above freezing temps and sun during the next couple of days. Um, with what had just happened at Snowbird, we were very concerned that we were gonna see big wet slab avalanches coming down and affecting structures, anyone on the roadways. So we kind of moved into a, a somewhat martial law sort of scenario. We would open in the morning for a few hours and then close. So we'd open from say six to nine and then close until seven or 8 p.m. when the sun was off the slopes, do any clearing of the roadway if anything had come down and then reopen for another couple few hours and then close again overnight in order to just control the situation up there. And then we did it again um, a couple of times, but Oh, I will say in addition to that, we really limited uh, where we were allowing people to park. So there was no roadside parking at Snowbird or Alta, anywhere that might be affected by avalanche hazard. So this really limited, especially for Snow Snowbird, the number of parking spaces that we had. That was another concern that we were gonna bring too many people up and not have a place to put them. So that was also part of the short morning window. After we lost our diurnal freeze, that was the morning of April 9th, we moved back into our full closure scenario. We closed April 9th, 
And we stayed closed after that for a number of days and just waited it out because we were no longer getting a refreeze. And it panned out for us, um, for some of us better than others. So the afternoon of April 9th, this is a private business vault. You can pay a lot of money to store your valuables deep in the mountains of the Wasatch <laughs> there, Easter Sunday. Um, so that afternoon at about 4 o'clock, we get a phone call from the caretakers of this vault. And their alarm has been tripped. And they're asking, because the road's closed, if one of us can go take a look and see what we see. So Stephen, who's in the area, he drives up there. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. So that was kind of the beginning of it all. That building is gone by the way. Um, there were four vehicles there, larger vehicles. They ended up a couple hundred feet down the hillside, upside down. That kind of kicked it off the next day at around noon. Um, you probably saw that previous picture. At around noon, this ran, this is White Pine 1, that blocked the road. At around 2, White Pine 3 ran and blocked the road. And at around 7, White Pine 4 ran. And it, you know that's just redundant at that point. So here we are. We're not sending maintenance workers to clean this up. The road is blocked. We're done. So the only uh, way to get in and out to Snowbird and Alta is via helicopter. We worked with the resorts, you know, we, we told them that at any point if we saw something alarming above the Snowbird Village or the town of Alta, we were going to shut them down, we were going to go into Interlodge. That never actually happened, but they were aware of the possibilities. Also on them was the fact that as the weather worsened, um, because it was nice the first couple days, but it did get windier and uh, with poor vis visibility, it was going to be on them as to whether they were going to stay open and operate and put people at risk on the, ski or on the ski hill. And they worked with it for a couple of days. And then finally, the last morning of this closure, it was really bad weather. And they chose to remain closed just because they didn't want to have that moral quandary, which kudos to them. So then. Um, April 13th rolls around, and it's the first morning after an overnight refreeze. So we get to work, the maintenance workers come on up, they start clearing the debris, and by 6.30 p.m. we're able to quietly reopen the road. And there was much rejoicing, mostly from the people stuck up in the canyon. Okay, well, that was it. No. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, so this is just kind of a, some of the, the season by the numbers. Um, obviously, these are all record numbers for our program, over 1,000 rounds of artillery, 900 rack detonations, crazy number of closure hours. The big one for me is this uh, 62 D3 avalanches onto the roadway. Um, the scale of that amount of debris that we had to clear is truly, it's just unbelievable. So pretty much everyone who I've met at ISSW or anywhere in the past six months has asked me what it was like to work in, in Utah in Little Cottonwood Canyon last winter and what did you take away from it? Um, and that's kind of a big question, I think. But I think Lori and I are going to try and give you a couple nuggets of, our, of, what, of what our takeaways are. Um, going back to resource management, it seems so simple, but staying on top of your equipment, doing all of your preventative maintenance work, and we're putting in the work to maintain that equipment and keep it operational is key to having a successful operation. And then in addition to that, you know, preparing for the worst, I think knowing when to move into that triaging of resources, knowing when you're in a losing battle and knowing when to, to stop and regroup. Yeah, and to kind of touch on, you know, preparing for the worst, you can say that, but what does it mean? Like, oh yeah, always prepare for the worst. Um, 
you know, I think you just have to take the time to imagine what the worst is. You know, are you going to run out of resources? What happens then? What's your backup plan? Um, who do you call? You know, that's a big one, knowing the first person that you're going to call or the second person that you're going to call. Um, if, you can't, if you can't pay attention to something, putting someone else in charge of that. So there's no, it's different for every program, but you have to try to envision it. Uh, I think, yeah, and again, prioritizing safety over stakeholder pressure. Um, I can't describe the amount of phone calls and logistics that went into every single road closure that we did. It would be a shocking number. Um, but in all of those very difficult phone calls with major stakeholders in the canyon, we had to prioritize safety, not only for ourselves, for the, for the maintenance workers, and for the, and for the general public. And that really meant that the road was closed for a long time. Staying focused, again, that's kind of a vague um, statement, but it's really hard. There's a lot of distractions out there. There's the phone calls. There's um, questions from people in your face. There's the maintenance. There's the logistical planning when you're thinking two weeks ahead, but really you have to remember what your job is in the moment. That is avalanche forecasting for the roadway in the moment, keeping people safe in the moment, including yourself. So it might not be you that's being focused, you might staying focused, you might be distracted by a million other things, but as long as someone on your team, for instance, when I was trapped out of the canyon, we had two forecasters who were still directly focused with their job in Little Cottonwood Canyon, making sure they were paying attention to what was going on above the structures in the roadway. Um. Yeah, and I think as we progressed through the winter when we got into snowpack situations that none of us had ex ever experienced before, um, our uncertainty grew, and then our margins of safety had to grow along with them. And that was that, and we really implemented that through closure. There was only so much mitigation work that we could do, and that margin of safety and exposing workers had to become always on the more conservative edge, um, and. We, you will be wrong. Uh, I think that we'll, maybe some of the stuff we talked about today, you know, we were certainly wrong that night that we almost got uh, taken out by those avalanches. And I guess that's okay. And I think that's um, something that we have come to terms with and we got lucky that night. And, but it's gonna happen again. It certainly happened, that's not the first time in my career that I've been wrong and it won't be the last. And that kind of circles back around to prepare for the worst, if you can. And I still think we're learning. So part of, part of what I'm doing to try and learn from some of these events, so this winter was a big event, it was the biggest, but we've had some big avalanche events uh, in the Cottonwoods in the past few years, and that really started getting me thinking about what do these avalanche events mean, and should we expect bigger avalanche events more often? So. We spent a ton of time doing event documentation, um, going through mapping trim lines, mapping avalanche runout areas, um, taking uh, tree samples, and having a lot of really interesting anecdotal conversations with past Little Cottonwood forecasters to really try and put some of these events uh, into context for us. And I did some work at ISIS, I wrote a paper at ISSW um, this past, uh, week if you want to go and read about some a little bit more about some of the results But the big takeaway is that yeah, in, we in the course of 50 years We are seeing bigger avalanches in Little Cottonwood Canyon and we're seeing them somewhat more frequently um, Additionally when we do have days when we do have avalanches We're seeing more avalanches on a similar number of days and it just reiterated the fact of uh, having really good documentation and analysis of these past events um, And lastly, I think the, one of the bigger takeaways of the winner is you know, the amount of public information that we put out. That really, it's hard to quantify how helpful that was, but putting out the amount of detailed information that we were doing, um, it really made the public kind of get on board with what was happening in the canyon, and we ended up getting a lot of buy-in. And this UDOT Cottonwoods team is pretty incredible. They're with us you know, in the trucks, 
on the scene doing a lot of this documentation and pushing out a lot of this information. And this was kind of like a season highlight reel thank you from what they did. Um, it's just some of the videos from the work from the winter. Um, but that was a huge takeaway and a huge success for our program this year. So it's normally a really rocking soundtrack right now. But. <laughs>